Welcome to Conversations with Gurmami. This is episode 3. Our guest is Tony Walby, who just recently competed in Seoul at the 2015 IPSA World Games in the sport of judo. Um, I fought Japan really well, and anytime you beat a Japanese fighter it's a, at a World Championships, it's always a, a good note. And our other guest is the VI judo coach, Andre Sunday. Now we have a system that is comparable to what uh, uh, the top countries in the world have, and that means centralized, uh, uh, well-equipped, well-coached, uh, uh, national training center where all of our best athletes are. Uh, the visually impaired world is exactly the same as the able by the judo. Tony was in Seoul alongside his fellow Canadian judokas Priscilla Gagne, Justin Karn, Alex Rodeman and their coach Andre Sunday. In this episode we talk about the competition and how Tony and his fellow teammates did. If you want more context to this story I recommend you listen to episode one. How, uh, how was Korea? To tell us about uh uh, Korea was, was good. The competition was really, really strong, really, really stiff. Um, I ended up in ninth place. Uh, in the first round, I had a bye. So I was uh, scheduled to fight the winner between uh, USA, Howard Wilson, and Japan. Uh, Japan won, so I ended up fighting Japan in the second round. Uh, I threw Japan right away for a half point, uh, countering his Uchimata attack. And then uh, the match went on for another two and a half, three minutes. And uh, Japan scored a Yuko on me. And then uh, with uh, about a minute and a half left, uh, Japan was still down that half point. So he went really hard at me uh, with uh, a big, strong Ochi attack. I stepped in and uh, lifted him and slammed him for the full point. Uh, so I won that round, which put me into the quarterfinals against Georgia. Georgia, the new fighter in our division, um, nobody had seen him before in the visual, visually impaired division, but we have seen him in the able-bodied. Uh, in 2014, he was ranked in the top 20 in the world in able-bodied, and then he took the 2015 off, or 2014-2015 season off of competition, and he's still ranked in the top 50 in the world in able-bodied. Wow. Um, so uh, it was actually, a lot of people were skeptical of his vision, and... Uh, as uh, rightly so, I mean, he, in our opinion, he's not visually impaired to the extent where he needs to fight in the VI division, but uh, I've got to fight everybody, I've got to beat everybody, so it didn't really matter to me whether people were thinking he was cheating or not. Um, in my opinion, he's just a judoka that I had to fight, and I was privileged to fight somebody of that caliber. Uh, I got in a really good, strong drop attack right off the bat, and he was able to sidestep it. We stood back up, we went back in for grips and movement, and he moved his body to the right, for which I thought was going to be a really strong, he's got a Koshi Garuma that we've seen, so I thought that was coming, so I sidestepped to try to, uh, to counter it, and in mid-motion he changed his technique into one of the strongest Osoto Garys I'd ever seen, and I went flying. Um, he flattened me out, he, he would go on to take gold. He had five matches. In four of those matches, he used four different techniques to slam the guy before he palm. And in a gold medal match against Sam Ingram, who, in my opinion, was the toughest guy going into this uh, competition, uh, he beat Sam very handedly in a five-minute match on penalties. But uh, uh, looking at the video of that match, if it had been an able-bodied match, Sam would have been penaltyed out in the first minute. Uh, the Georgian did 17 super strong attacks against Sam in the five minutes, and Sam did zero. Uh, Sam was able to use his agility to basically avoid getting thrown. Mm -hmm. And that's all the match was, was Sam running away from the Georgian, which was so surprising to me. Uh, the Georgian has so much power and so much strength. Uh, it was a joy to fight him, and it was a joy to watch him fight afterwards. Uh, so that put me down into Repicharge. In Repicharge, I fought the Ukrainian. Uh, this is the second time I fought this Ukrainian. I fought him at last year's World Championships as well when I was injured. Mm -hmm. This time I was healthy. Um, it was a three-minute match. I, uh, I attacked him with really strong attacks. He countered, uh, he countered my left Osoto in the first minute and scored a Yuko. And then in the third minute, um, I was coming across for a, an Ogoshi, and I had taken a half step too soon, and... He was able to lift me up in a Harai Sir Komiyashi and just slam me. Uh, he'd go on to take bronze. 
I ended up in uh, in ninth, like I said. So, uh, not the best result, not the result I was looking for, but uh, I'm not disappointed with the way I fought. Um, I fought Japan really well, and anytime you beat a Japanese fighter, it's a at a world championships, it's always a, a good note. Um, uh, the Georgian, I learned a lot fighting him, even though it was a very brief match. And the Ukrainian, I learned a lot fighting him. Uh, I think the next time I fight him, it will be a much different result. I now just have to uh, look forward to this summer's uh, Para Pan American Games, uh, prepare to fight uh, the Cuban, the Argentinian, and the American. Those are the three strong guys in my division. Um, and we'll move forward from there. But were any of these uh, South Americans, uh, were they at the, uh, in, in South Korea, were they competing? Yep, um, the American, the defending world champion, ended up right. in fifth place. He lost, to, uh, he lost to Uzbekistan in a bronze medal, and he lost to Sam Ingram in the, uh, in the quarterfinals. This uh, is D'Artagnan? D'Artagnan, okay. yeah, D'Artagnan Crockett. Right. Uh, the Argentinian ended up in seventh place, he lost to Spain in the quarterfinals, and he lost to D'Artagnan in the repechage. Um, the Cuban was not in uh, South Korea. Uh, he's a defending Paralympic champion, and he's actually in jeopardy of not even qualifying for Rio. Right now, I believe after this World Championships, he'll sit in 12th or 13th place, and he'll have to wake his way up into uh, 10th. So mm -hmm. it's not going to be easy for him to to gain the points necessary without the people in front of him gaining points as well. Uh, the Brazilian uh, got no points at this tournament, the number one Brazilian. He lost to uh, D'Artagnan in the first round and D'Artagnan lost to Sam in the next round. So uh, Brazil gets an automatic spot in the, uh, the pair of pans and uh, we're not sure which Brazilian will be there this summer. Mm -hmm. It could be either number one or the number two. Uh, either way, uh, I have to prepare for either one of them, and I've beaten uh, one of them before at the World Championships, and the other one I've never had the pleasure of fighting. So, it, uh, but I have watched them, so it'll be uh, interesting to see which one shows up. Mm -hmm. um, and the rest of the South Americans, uh, well, there was another American there, uh, Howard Wilson. He lost to Japan in the first round, and he was out. The Mexican uh, lost in the first round and he was out. And uh, I believe that's the uh, extent of what will be at Parapans this summer. What was the mood going into uh, uh, South Korea for, for you and the team? I was what actually was very vibe? confident. I was very, and I still am very confident. I'm, I believe I'm, I'm one of the top 10 in the world and I'm still ranked in the top 10 in the world. I believe that outside of this Georgian and Sam, uh, number three to number 10, uh, the difference between those fighters is very small. Uh, I think the Georgian is heads and heels above uh, every single player in that division. And I feel that uh, Sam Ingram is very, very strong. And like I said before, for me to beat Sam, um, I would have to have the day of my life and Sam would have to have a mediocre day. Mm -hmm. But this is judo and anything is possible. Uh, I feel my groundwork is better than Sam, so I could catch him on the ground, and that could end the match right there. Uh, with the Georgian, he's super strong. Uh, I feel if I have a chance to fight him again in Rio, it uh, will be a strategic match where I will have to try to wear him out because my conditioning is better than everybody in the division, so I'm going to have to play on that. But going into this t competition, I was I was confident. I'm still confident. Uh, our training in Korea was really well. Uh, the whole team was, was very upbeat, very uh, uh, lively. We, mm -hmm. we trained every day while we were there. Um, after the draw, we were, we were still, uh, still upbeat after the draw. I mean, I, we'd never seen this Georgian fight in the VI side of it. Uh, our coach did know who the Georgian was. He had seen him fight on the able bodied side, but again, the Georgian had to fight the Ukraine in the first round. and. Uh, I had to fight Japan, well, the second round, and I had to fight Japan in the second round, and we got to watch the Georgian uh, throw the Ukraine, so we knew what to expect, and uh, on this day, I just wasn't strong enough to deal with him. Back to the drawing board to deal with, uh, with the, the guys ahead of me, and I, I feel I can still get on that podium in Rio. If I didn't feel that way, um, I would retire.
Mm. But I still feel like I can get on the podium, so I'm going to push for it. So the, the Para Pan Ams are the upcoming uh, tournament for for you, and they're in uh, July or? Um, I compete August 14th August in 12. Toronto. Okay. Oh, in Whitby actually. Um, they they're from the 12th to the 14th. So the light divisions are on the 12th, and middleweight divisions the 13th, and uh, the heavier divisions are the 14th. Before we get into the, the Para Pan Ams, can you tell us about Priscilla and how she did in uh, competition? Uh, Priscilla actually had a, a good draw, um, in our opinion. When we saw the draw, uh, four of the top five people in Priscilla's division were on the top quarter of the draw, and Priscilla was on the bottom. She had China in the first round, and she had fought China at last year's World Championships and lost to China, but the year of preparation uh, going in, we thought Priscilla would be able to uh, defeat China, and there was a couple of times in the match that Priscilla had uh, had some good, strong uh, attacks, and Priscilla went in for a strong Ogoshi against China, and China just with like an inch or a quarter of an inch got her hip in front of Priscilla, and finished the technique. It was uh, very quick, very uh, very strong match for Priscilla, and she fought really hard in it, really strong in it, and had the ability to win the match. It was just, uh, I believe, China's experience of, of reacting to Priscilla's attack. Uh, had Priscilla been a quarter of a second quicker, mm -hmm. uh, the match could have ended much differently. China then went on to fight uh, Russia. It was a new Russian in the division, Again, a Russian nobody had seen, um, and Russia destroyed everybody. Mm. So Russia destroyed China, uh, and that knocked Priscilla out. And then in the semifinals, Russia destroyed, I believe it was either Ukraine or Germany. Um, and then in the, well, it was Germany actually. Uh, and then in the final, Russia uh, destroyed the Ukrainian. It wasn't, it wasn't uh, a match to watch. Like, it was just so quick, uh, mm. this Russian, competitor was so strong, so skillful, and it was her first VI tournament. So again, a lot of questions were asked about the classification, but again, you have to fight everybody. The rules are the same for everybody. Uh, it was unlucky that uh, Priscilla did not win that first match, and uh, she got no ranking and no points out of this competition, but she's still uh, in a really good position to qualify for Rio. She still has a really good chance of meddling in Rio. Uh, she'll have to train a little harder, a little more tactical to beat the, the Russian and the Chinese and the, uh, and the Ukrainian and the Germany. But uh, she does have the ability. This summer she will have to compete against uh, Brazil. And Brazil is a very strong competitor. Uh, Priscilla's fought her once before and uh, has scored on her, lost to her, but has scored on her. So Priscilla has a, a good chance to win the pair of pans this summer. How, uh, how about the other two members of the team? I believe there are um, two other members, right? Alex Rodman in 81 kilos had a very tough draw. In the first round, he fought the defending world champion from Mexico and uh, lost. And then in the second round, in a repechage, fought the defending world silver medalist from Ukraine and, and lost. Uh, against the Ukrainian, he, he stood up pretty good. Uh, but he's got a long way to go to be able to, to match them technique for technique. He needs to start working tactics to, to beat them on his strength. He's very powerful, very unpredictable. He's a very good ground fighter. Um, he needs to match them on those levels and not on the, the technical experience level. Uh, his division ended up being winning, won by a South Korean, uh, one of the few B1s to win a gold medal. Uh, very, very strong uh, fighter. Uh, Justin Karn was uh, the surprise of the team uh, in his placing. He placed seventh, but uh, not surprised in the way he fought. He trains really hard and he fought really hard. Uh, he, uh, in his quarterfinal match, he threw the Japanese for Wazari in, in the first uh, few seconds of the match and then fought hard against him for the next two and a half, three minutes dominating him. And uh, with under two minutes to go, uh, he made a very small mistake on the ground and the Japanese turned him over and held him down. So that was his first chance to fight into the medal round. Had he won that match, he would have been in the medal round. Mm. And uh, 
that put him in a rubbish charge against France, who had beaten him in the past. And Justin fought a tremendous match against the, the French and, and beat the French kid. And uh, then had his second chance to uh, to make it into the medal round. See, in the rubbish charge final, he fought Kazakhstan. And uh, Kazakhstan, I can't pronounce that properly, but <laughs> he, uh, he fought him. And uh, halfway through the match, or three quarters of the way through the match, Justin had turned him over into a hold down. And uh, Justin was losing by Wazari at this point, and uh, for some reason, Justin just stood up, in the, and the hold-down was nullified, and uh, he go, went on to lose that match and ended up in seventh place. Uh, talking to him after, he was confused on the referee's calling. He didn't hear Osakomi, he heard Matei, and that, uh, that's why he got up. Uh, it was frustrating, because had he won that match, he would have fought for bronze. Mm. And uh, he could have won the bronze medal. Like he could have medaled at this tournament, and that's the really frustrating part for him. Uh, I feel bad for him because of a, a couple of mental mistakes cost him a chance at a medal. But uh, the seventh place finish for him actually moves him uh, one step closer to qualifying for Rio. So I'm very happy for that. Uh, anytime a uh, teammate gets closer to qualifying for Paralympics, you have to be happy. And a top seven finish at the World Championships is nothing to. Uh, just, just near out. So he had a tremendous competition. The whole mm -hmm. team fought well. We just, some of us had uh, stronger draws than other, and, and some of us benefited from the draws. Now let's hear from the team's coach, Andre. It was a very good trip for us. Although uh, I must admit that uh, results could have been better and should have been better. From uh, my perspective, we experienced some surprises that uh, uh, perhaps resulted in the outcome as it was. Uh, Justin Karn, not from this dojo, but member of our team, uh, performed uh, uh, very well. Uh, he accomplished his lifetime best uh, performance with uh, top seven finish in the World Championships. Uh, yet uh, it was a disappointing uh, result uh, for him and for me, because in both matches that he lost, he won three matches against strong opponents, lost two. In both of those matches that he lost, he actually was leading and uh, had a very real opportunity to end uh, at, on the podium in this competition. He was leading against the Japanese in a quarterfinal by Wazari, lost by Ipan, and he uh, held in Osaikami uh, his Kazakh uh, opponent in the final of the Repashash, and for uh, no reason whatsoever let him out uh, of the Osaikami, just got up and stood up. Um, claiming later that he heard the referee calling Mate, but, which was not the case. Uh, so that uh, Justin Carnes' best performance, uh, Priscilla, uh, had been relatively unlucky, I would say, because uh, there were two surprises in the competition. Two new fighters showed up in uh, in uh, the field of visual in Perjuroka, both of them from uh, able-bodied world, and both of them uh, won the competition. Uh, uh, without without any questions, just defeated the opposition without uh, uh, breaking a sweat. And those two uh, newcomers, one from Russia, one from Georgia, former Soviet Republic, mm -hmm. uh, both competed against uh, Canadians. One of them was uh, Priscilla, one of them was Tony, and uh, both, of the, both of those newcomers uh, came up on top uh, and uh, uh, eventually won the competition, which was a surprise to us because if you have somebody in the field whom you don't know, you don't uh, know that uh, who they are, and uh, uh, when you analyze the draw and the possible possibilities for your athletes, you always take one step at a time, yet at the same time you see the big picture, you mm -hmm. try to envision what may happen. I've um, kind of uh, envisioned that uh, Priscilla is going to uh, do better uh, based on her draw. Uh, three people whom she defeated uh, two months ago in uh, February in Hungary. Um, three people uh, uh, placed in top eight in this competition. So uh, she definitely was not uh, outmatched by her capacity. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it didn't happen in this competition. She made a small mistake fighting against Chinese opponent and the Chinese capitalized on it and threw her for a pump. And the match was over. The Chinese lost the first, the second round to the newcomer Russian and thus uh, uh, Priscilla was eliminated from, from the repashash. 
Are, are these newcomers B3s or, or B? Like what, uh, well, they are classified uh, based on the on the standards uh, of the International Blind Sport Association. Mm -hmm. uh, as you can imagine, there is a lot of controversy sure, in, sure. in that world. Um, uh, there is even an ironic uh, expression among coaches uh, from the visually impaired world, from mm -hmm. different coaches from different countries, that we are competing in B5 competition, which is wow. not a really encouraging sign because it uh, uh, speaks to the fact that uh, not everybody is taking this matter in an ethical fashion and uh, some people just uh, um, get classified based on how they are trained to be classified. Interesting. So it's interesting, exactly, and, uh, and uh, somewhat discouraging to those athletes who really have uh, a severe visual impairment, and uh, our athletes do, and you know, as you know, um, there are countries that are extremely strong in this field, uh, that have mixture of uh, dramatically uh, visually impaired athletes, B1s, uh, without eyes and those are still very strong judo players. Mm -hmm. But there are countries that came up um, recently into that field uh, of the uh, world impaired judo, and those guys um, have practically teams of B3s, which is the uh, least uh, right. amount of, uh, of visual impairment, and that's at least how they are classified, and they, dominant. they are dominant in that field right now. So. Uh, it's difficult to predict what the future holds. I know that there is serious discussion on uh, new standards of classification for the visually impaired uh, sports, not just judo, and uh, how it is going to turn out, it's, uh, it's difficult to speculate at this time. That's an important issue for, for IBSC to so tackle, yeah, because otherwise... Uh it is, it is, but it, it is a double-edged sword, you know. Uh, I'm not sure whether you, you are familiar with the history, but wrestling used to be a Paralympic sport until 1984, I believe. And, okay. and uh, uh, due to lack of numbers, the wrestling uh, competition was uh, cancelled from the Paralympic event. Uh, wrestling is, uh, you know, it's, it's a specific case because wrestling is very popular in North America, so USA and Canada, so those are two countries. Less wrestling was also very popular in the Soviet countries, mm -hmm. the Soviet Union, and right. now is popular in all of those, most of the Soviet republics. But it was uh, relatively dead in, uh, in Western European societies and... Uh, and uh, Pretty much the place of wrestling of of, of, uh, the, of the early uh, 20th century was taken by judo in most of the Western European countries. So wrestling uh, was not really a very uh, well populated sport, even on the able by the side in the Olympics on the Olympic cycle until the breakdown of Soviet Union, where you had 50 new countries joining that movement. So that sparked new life into that uh, uh, that uh, scenario. In judo, on the other hand, uh, the, the number of countries uh, uh, involved in, in our movement is growing steadily. And as you know, in the International Federation, we have right now 183 countries and 130, 140 are competing at the World Championships level. So that is double or triple or quadruple most of the other sports involved in the Olympic movement. On the, on the visually impaired side, we have had 40 countries competing in, in uh, Korea, mm. which is a very large number. And, um, and uh, considering that, um, the, the judo is relatively safe in the Paralympic movement. It's very difficult to predict what is going to happen if the reclassification happens and the so-called B3s are mm -hmm. no longer eligible to compete because then the numbers will dwindle dramatically sure. and uh, judo may lose its uh, Paralympic status. Mm. So that is, uh, again, something that uh, the powers are disputing and discussing and uh, contemplating what to do. This situation certainly sounds complicated. We'll hear more from Coach Andre in a couple of minutes. So, Tony, which cities do Justin Karn and Alex Rodeman train out of? Alex lives in Hamilton, and he is moving to Montreal in the next uh, couple of months to live and train full-time at the uh, INS in Montreal, the National Training Centre. Mm -hmm. And Justin lives in Montreal and trains at the National Training Centre okay. uh, on a daily basis. So, Justin has been there a year now, and that is the, the, the reason why his technique and his fighting ability has, has gone up. He's become uh, a really strong threat in uh, minus 60 kilos 
uh, I think because he's now training full time at the National Training Center. Well, can you elaborate on that, on, on the advantages of obviously you know, well, training at the National Training Center? Because of the geography of Canada, we're such a large country right. with such a small population of judoka, um, it's hard to find dojos that have very high level fighters your weight class. Mm -hmm. So you need to go to a place where you're going to have a large number of bodies that are very highly skilled that are within 10 kilos of your weight so that you can fight every day, day in and out against very hard competition to improve your skill. If you're at a club where you only have one competitor to fight against and he outweighs you by 25, 30 kilos, you're never going to improve your skill to the level necessary to compete at international level. Mm -hmm. So the National Training Center in Montreal is where uh, the top 100 to 150 people in the country live and train and compete. And uh, in Montreal, Justin being 60 kilos has a number of very high level 60 kilo and 66 kilo competitors to compete against. Now they're all able-bodied, mm -hmm. but they all use the VI rules when competing against Justin uh, in training. So they they're there. They help Justin. Justin helps them. It's it's very cohesive in Montreal. And uh, you said there's 100 to 150. 100, 100, 100 to 150 competitors in Montreal okay. training at the INS uh, regularly. What percentage of those are uh, from Montreal vis-a-vis -vis other cities? Uh, like are they all? They've all lo relocated to Montreal. Uh, a, a large number of them have relocated to Montreal. Mm -hmm. A very large number. Well, a very large number of them have, have changed from their provincial organization to competing for Quebec. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of them come from Quebec in different regions: Quebec City, uh, Septils. Uh, Septils has a huge judo club, uh, really far north Quebec. But uh, they've all move to to Montreal. Mm -hmm. Ontario has a number of very high level fighters that have moved to Montreal and now fight for Quebec. Uh, BC, Alberta, they, the top fighters that are uh, college and university age move to Montreal. Mm -hmm. It's been that way for many, many, many decades. Uh, in the past, the National Training Center was a dojo in Montreal called Shidokan. And then a year ago, we opened the INS, the National Training Center in Montreal, which is this multi-million dollar complex at the Olympic O mm -hmm. that uh, includes uh, a mat area that has the space for four tatami, so four competition areas mm -hmm. uh, of training space, which is huge. Uh, an Olympic-sized weight room, uh, medical staff, so physiotherapy, uh, massage therapy, uh, sports psychology, it's all there, all accessible to the national team. So able-bodied and visually impaired national team have this wonderful facility to go to and train at. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's great. Um, it's too bad it wasn't around 25 years ago when uh, I was that age, but uh, for the up-and-coming uh, competitors, it's, it's going to make a huge difference for Canada on the international scene. Mm -hmm. So now uh, go, going into the Para Pan Ams in, in August uh, in Whitby, What's the, between now and then, what are you focusing on uh, as far as your training on the mat and, and even off the mat? What, what, um, what's the focus? I'm going to, I'm not going to change much uh, away from my preparation that we were preparing for, uh, for Korea with. Um, it's going to go back into uh, a 10 week cycle. I do believe we have just under uh, 10 weeks until, uh, until we compete. Um, it'll be at the discretion of uh, the coach Andres Adaj as to exactly what uh, I work on, but I'll keep my conditioning up really high. Um, I'll spend the next uh, two, three weeks working some more power and uh, just on the mat training, uh, sparring, uh, everything to, to get my, my body and my mindset ready for pair of pants. And at the same time, we'll look at the different fighters that I'll be fighting because it's a much smaller uh, group that will be there um, like I said, there's there's really only four strong fighters that I will go up against there. So we can work strategy and tactics for each one of those fighters on uh, how to make my technique work for me against them. So we'll be spending time on that. Uh, outside of that, it's just regular training. Hmm. What, um, uh, Andre, your coach, what does he... What has he told you post uh, on 
post competition? What's been his? Uh, well, his Andres, to you? Andres is a very, very strong coach. He he doesn't uh, he doesn't stroke your ego. He he tells you when you fight good. He tells you when you fight bad. He tells you the mistakes that you make, and he's 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 very direct. Uh, he told me that the Georgian fighter was much stronger than I was, much better than I was, and that uh, if I were to face him again that, uh, to beat him, I will have to get lucky. But again, everybody's beatable, everybody has a weakness, and we'll try to find it. Uh, my fight against Ukraine, he, uh, he asked me if I was mentally ready for it after the match when we, when we talked about it, because uh, going into Japan, uh, the first match, uh, he said I was so focused, so laser beamed on the Japanese fighter that uh, that I was even intimidating him. <laughs> Instead of I was, hmm. I intimidated the Japanese fighter, but I had Andre. Andre said it jokingly, of course, but uh, I was I was really focused on that first match, sure. and I guess that second match against Georgia uh, maybe rattled me a little bit that I wasn't as focused and as set against Ukraine as I I should have been. So we'll go back and we'll work on that, that uh, being able to brush off one match to prepare for the next one. Uh, but again, Andres doesn't mince words. He, he'll tell you uh, what you've done right, what you've done wrong, what you need to work on. Uh, he'll tell you if you need to go back to the drawing board and he'll tell you if you don't belong there. Um, it's, uh, it's great to have a coach like that Mm -hmm. uh, and I feel that that's what this team needs. We need a coach that is not going to pat you on the back and go, well, he was the world champion, so uh, it, you couldn't have beat him. No, he, we need a coach that says he was the world champion. He was better than you, right? This is what you need to do to get better than him, or this is what we need to work on to beat him, uh, even though he is better than you. Mm -hmm. That's the type of coach we need. We don't need uh, a coach that just goes, oh, well, bad luck. And Andres is not that coach. Andres does not say, oh, well, bad luck. He says, he was tough. He was better than you. Um, you want to be better than him, you need to do this. Okay, let's hear from Coach Andre about the upcoming para Pan Ams. So, Coach, what's the focus for these athletes? Well, our focus doesn't change. You know, it, it, it is an uh, unfortunate uh, part of living in a sport. You, you, you lose a battle. You have to regroup very quickly, forget about the last battle, take, uh, lear learn from it what you can and keep going and continue. Uh, the Para Panam is another Paralympic qualifier for us and from this perspective it's very important for our athletes to perform very well there. And it's not going to be easy, uh, in particular in Tony's division, uh, he is facing um, at least three very, very strong people, uh, two of them former world champions, one from the USA, one from Cuba. Uh, Cubans, by the way, did not come to Seoul. It was one of the strong countries, actually the only very strong uh, judo country that was missing from Seoul, and we don't know why, probably financial reasons. Mm. But uh, they will be here at the Parapanam, and for Tony, uh, to ensure that his Olympic, uh, Paralympic qualification uh, is alive, uh, he has to perform very well, so hopefully win. Uh, which will be a challenge. For Priscilla, similar challenge. Uh, she has very strong uh, opponents uh, in her weight division from the, within the Panam Union. Uh, although for her, the task is to, to win the gold medal in the competition. This is what uh, the objective uh, we set for ourselves after, after February event, because now she is actually the leader in the world ranking uh, within the Pan American uh, continent. Uh, the one, the one person that we worry about is uh, worry about or think about uh, defeating her is a Brazilian, who also did not perform well in in, uh, in Seoul. So they are fighting for probably the remaining Paralympic spot, Priscilla and the Brazilians. So it's it's important competition for her. Mm. Uh, for the other guys who are not from Ottawa, Justin Karn and Alexander Adaman, they they are training at now at the National Training Center in Montreal. They are both b freeze so they can actually function uh, relatively well uh, without without uh, uh, any particular assistance. And uh, just how important is that to be training at, uh, at the national, national training center, center. Yeah. especially for high level? I believe it's uh, as important as for able by the athletes. You know, again, we discussed. I, I, I talk about it. I, I've, uh, 
we have a system now in place that uh, we haven't had for uh, for uh, from from the beginning of judo. Now we have it. Now we have a system that is comparable to what uh, uh, the top countries in the world have, and that means centralized, uh, well-equipped, well-coached. Uh, national training center where all of our best athletes are. Uh, the visually impaired world is exactly the same as the able by the judo. Uh, the, the athletes have to train with the best in order to become better and better. And those countries that are leading, uh, they do exactly that. They have, they have their visually impaired programs are either centralized by itself if they're large enough, like Russia, Ukraine and uh, uh, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan. Azerbaijan, those countries have centralized systems, France, um, but some countries uh, have centralization uh, with the able body, like Great Britain, and, and uh, they are actually improving their program at, in, in leaps and bounces. They have uh, several very young athletes who are going to become major powers in the, uh, in the Paralympic judo very soon, and, and they are training full time uh, with, uh, with their able body counterparts. Back to Tony and how he thinks the coach feels about the team's overall performance. Andres was actually quite pleased with our performance overall. Mm -hmm. um, he was frustrated with, with some of the stuff that we did as a team on the mat. Uh, my fight against Ukraine, Justin's fight against Japan, and against Kazakhstan. Um, but at no time did he ever say, oh, it was bad luck because Priscilla had China, or it was bad luck because I fought Georgia, or it was bad luck because uh, Alex had the Mexican and the Ukrainian in the first two rounds. At no time did he say that, because we're there to beat these guys. Mm -hmm. We have to beat them all, so uh, it doesn't matter what the draw says. And he's very good at managing the draw for us, too. Um, he kept the draw, I'm not going to say secret, he'd let us know it if we wanted to know it, but he gave us the advice that uh, since the draw was done on a Tuesday night and uh, I did not fight till Friday, we did not talk about my draw or the match I would have until Friday morning. And uh, so I had no idea who I was fighting till Friday morning. Mm. And I was, I have a lot of experience, so I don't think it would have bothered me one way or another knowing, mm -hmm. but I did get good night's sleeps beforehand because I didn't worry. And that's was the same with Priscilla. Priscilla fought on Thursday and she didn't know who she was fighting till Thursday morning. Mm -hmm. And she was relaxed right up until then. Any last words you want to share no. with, uh, with your athletes? Uh, no, I've read if we already shared it, you know, I had, uh, <laughs> I've, uh, I've had the... Uh, Did you enjoy Korea? Obviously, it's always yeah. a pleasure to, to to be with athletes who, you know, with this kind of attitude, mm -hmm. uh, which is, I mean, this kind of attitude that means great attitude. They they really uh, they really want to do uh, well in the competition. They're very receptive to coaching, and and uh, they were very disappointed with their own performances, uh, which obviously rubs on 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 me, on the coaches, and. and um, uh, but at the same time, you know, they have no reason to be disappointed. They, they, they were well prepared. They are well prepared to compete. Uh, they sometimes will succeed, sometimes they will not. That's the nature of the sport. We do not have, you know, uh, world leaders right now in our in our system that uh, uh, should uh, justifiably be disappointed because they don't perform. You know, if once we have athletes of this caliber and of this quality, then yes, if they don't win, which will be their job, then uh, they should be disappointed if they are not, that means that they, are, they don't belong where they are. Mm -hmm. But uh, in our case, we have athletes who are on the you know, uphill, they're climbing all the time. So it's uh, obviously everyone is disappointed when something doesn't work uh, the, the way uh, we, we dream or we set goals for. Um, but at the same time, one has to be realistic you know, and evaluate the possibilities and, and uh, opportunities uh, as, as they are. You know, if, if we would go uh, with uh, blindfolds on our eyes and say, oh, let's go for a win and without analyzing the <coughs> opposition, the situation, you know, it's just uh, simply immature. Hmm. How was Seoul? Did you like it? Did, did you try any makoli, which is the Korean rice wine? Or? Um, obviously not. You're there training. You're not there drinking. Uh, well, Seoul was so really, true. really a phenomenal city. It's it's so crowded. Uh, mm -hmm. 
It's all high rise. We saw no houses. Right. We saw no houses at all. It's all high rises. And it's all concrete and steel. Mm -hmm. And I was expecting to see small little compact cars like you see in uh, Europe or in yeah. other Asian countries. No, we saw big SUVs and all brand new cars. And sure. everywhere we went had free Wi-Fi. It was uh, a very modern city. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a lot of fun. We went to the Royal Palace on uh, our last day there after competition was over. Um, after competition was over, we went to uh, a Korean barbecue and um, I tried what they called their Korean vodka. Soju. Yeah. yeah. It tastes a lot like uh, Zambuca. Right, right. Got a little right. bit of a licorice taste to it. Uh, uh -huh. I did br bring a bottle home for my uh, collection. Cool. But uh, uh, we, had, uh, we had a Korean guide with us that trains at the dojo here at okay. Takashi with uh, Dehora Yoon. She uh, right now lives in, in Seoul, Korea, taking mm -hmm. care of her grandparents when studying for the uh, law school admissions test. So uh, in Korea or in, in, in Seoul? Yeah, she's okay. in Seoul. She's part of. Uh, no, I mean the, the the law admissions in Korea. Well, she's going to take the LSAT. Oh, okay, okay. Right, yeah, she's right. going to take the LSAT, and then she's actually hoping to get into Ottawa U. Okay. So uh, she's trained here at, at the dojo with us for five years, and then mm -hmm. she went home last year to take care of her grandparents in Seoul. So it was just uh, gratuitous that when we got there we had a guide mm -hmm. and she took us around to the royal palace and we got to 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 see that and uh she was uh there to help priscilla as a training partner mm -hmm. so priscilla had a girl her weight to train with leading up to the competition uh she was there on all our competition days to cheer us on and to translate for us uh for some of this, the stuff that we did and uh then we went out to a bunch of different restaurants after the competition with her and had some uh some traditional cuisine and uh it was uh Seoul was a, a really nice place to visit. I would never want to live there, okay. but it's a really nice place to visit. Right <laughs> All right, so um, going into the Para Pan Ams, what are you hoping for? What are you, obviously you want to win. W what are you hoping, how are you going to make that happen? Well, I'm preparing to win. Preparing uh, to it, win. It's not, it's not a hoping, it's I'm preparing to win. Okay. I'm, uh, I'm going to... A, follow the instructions of my, my coach, mm -hmm. uh, follow my training plan that the coach lays out for me. Uh, we're going to prepare for any possible competitor I'll come up against. Uh, I'm going to stay healthy. That, to me, is the most important thing. Uh, I'm going to do uh, no trainings that are not uh, scheduled by my coach. I'm not going to train with any partners that are not set up for by my coach. I'm going to make sure that everything between now and... and August 14th is planned. We're going to uh, get there and win uh, the way I won that first match in Korea. I'm going to be laser focused on every opponent. Um, I need to beat them. I need to win. I need mm -hmm. to get on that podium. Uh, I did, I've not trained this long and this hard to go into a competition uh, ill-prepared. Right. So we're going to do everything we can to prepare for for this competition, especially a competition that uh, I know I'm one of the strongest in the division. Mm -hmm. uh, in the Americas, yes, the defending Paralympic champion is, is there from Cuba. Uh, the 2014 world champion is there from the United States. Uh, the Argentinian, who is super strong in the uh, 2012 Paralympic bronze medal, is there. But I've seen them all fight. I fought with, uh, in training with all of them. Um, I fought in competition with, with, with a few of them. I know I can beat them, and mm. that's how we're going into that competition. Mm. We're going in there to get to the top of the podium. And it's on home soil. I'm going to have the fans behind me. I'm going to have a uh, home mat advantage, if we can call it that, and I will win. Do you guys plan on, on going to uh, Montreal to, to train and that facility as well? Is, is that scheduled well, in? Or? The plan right now, it looks like the last week of July and the first week and a half of August, leading up to August 10th, we will be in Montreal. Mm -hmm. we, will, we will not go to the Parapan American Game open cer opening ceremonies in Toronto. We will still be in Montreal training. Mm -hmm. We will travel from Montreal to Toronto uh, two days before uh, the first day of competition. So that will be four days before my competition. Uh, so on August 10th, we'll travel to the uh, Pan American Village in Toronto, and we will 
then start preparing there uh, for the last couple of days until Justin fights and then Priscilla and and my, Alex and myself. So we will be in Montreal a good uh, 15, 16 days of training leading up to the Para Pan American Games. Mm. Very cool. I want to wish you uh, all the best. Obviously, I want to interview you some more uh, pre, just a little bit before the Para Pan Ams. And, and, sure, and sure. Um, I might, I mean, it's it's in Canada. I don't know what, uh, it's in Toronto maybe, or Whitby. Maybe I can come catch uh, some of the fights. But uh, is there anyone uh, you want to... You want to thank or, or, or plug well, any sponsors? Any? Well, of course. I'd like, well, first off, thank my sponsors, Matsuru Judo Gi. They're, uh, they're phenomenal. And fighting in those gis was very comfortable. And um, they were very, very nice Judo Gis. Uh, Can Fund. Which, well, what's uh, the website? What's the website? You got to uh, plug the website. Well, Mat Matsuru Canada. So you'll have okay. to, uh, MatsuruCanada.com, I believe. Okay. And then uh, Canadian Athlete Now Fund uh, is a. Tr uh, the, wonderful organization that funds Canadian athletes to go to these competitions. Um, they're, they're a sponsor of mine and they're, they're behind uh, almost uh, a good uh, 75 to 80 percent of the national team they, they help uh, fund. And uh, Takahashi Dojo, of course, uh, Jun Sensei, uh, this dojo is phenomenal for me. I've been here for so long and they, they treat me so well and uh, their family. Uh, and of course, Coach Andres, uh, I think my judo in the last year is some of the strongest judo I've done in uh, in decades under him. So it's it's phenomenal. Uh, I guess that's it. I mean, I, I thank everybody that supports me. I thank everybody that, that pushes for me, behind me, and, and does pat me on the back and say, keep going. Um, I want to thank everybody. Everybody has helped me along the way. My family, my friends, my club mates, my teammates. Uh, all of Judo Canada has helped. And... Uh, we will get to Rio, and we will get on the podium at Rio, and uh, after that, then I'll get to relax. All the best. Thank you. This is Conversations with Garmami. My website is garmami.com. That's G-A-R-M-A-M-I-E.com. Thank you for listening.